Well, my name's Jeremy Masterson, and first, I injured my leg over the weekend, so if you see me kind of hobble around, I normally try to interact a little bit more throughout these, but you may see me, you know, sit in the chair, grimace, and cry a little bit. So if that happens, just, you know, let, let the tears go. I'll, I'll come back stronger than I was before. So, well, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about networking today. Um, I guess, first off, can anybody tell me what is networking to you as a, as a, as a college student, as an undergrad person? Um, somebody give me an idea what a definition of networking, or when you hear networking, um, what is it? What type of image does it bring up? I'll call on people. We talked about the Socratic method at dinner last night, and that's where the person up here gets to drill all the people out there. So don't make me you know, single people out, because I have single people out I know. Typical lawyer. Typical lawyer. That's well. Typical lawyer. <laughs> you. Getting your name out there to others, most definitely. Um, I come with gifts, too, so <laughs> participation is strongly, strongly encouraged. Getting your name out there. You know, that's uh, the general premise of networking. You know, if, you, if, you, if you take the ING out and all you do is focus on network, uh, what you're really doing is trying to identify the people and the industries and the companies that you're connected to. Uh, anybody that's got a phone and can Google it uh, brings up a definition. It's, it's interacting with other people to exchange information, develop contacts, especially to further one's career, getting your name out there. Now, when I think of networking, uh, it brings to mind crowded rooms full of cheesy people throwing one-liners and business cards. Hey, my name's Jeremy Masterson. Nice to meet you. Here's my card. We'll do lunch. Drives me insane. When I think of networking, that's what I think of. I think of individuals that are out there. I think of one-sided conversations. Um, I think of a lot of people trying to gain access to individuals for their own personal gain. Um, the, the own personal gain, I think, is highlighted in the definition where it's to benefit one's career. What I'd like to do today is to try to change your perspective a little bit on networking. What is networking? I like to think of networking more in the terms of relationship building. Um, let's identify who we are, let's identify what we're good at, uh, and let's shift from the idea that I need to meet people to benefit my career, to get my name out, and I need to do things that are going to add value to other people's lives. Um, it'll be absolutely amazing, the transition that'll happen individually, if you start to think of it as relationship building and you come out of this idea of networking. Um, relationship building is something that we all do all the time, whether we want to or not. You build relationships in your classes. You build relationships when you play sports. You build relationships internally with your family. You know, we are built to build relationships. Um, unless you're going to be a hermit living under a bridge, you know people and people know you. The idea in taking it from networking to relationship building is to establish a, a pattern where it just becomes part of your daily life. Um, you know, I, people joke, or I, I got made fun of quite a bit in law school. After the first semester, I wore a suit every day. Um, you know, a lot of my classmates were still doing the sweatpants thing and, you know, the cutoff shorts, and, and that's fine, uh, but I wanted to be turned on all the time. You never know who you're going to run into. You never know who you're going to meet. Uh, and I've pulled clients out of grocery stores. I've gotten job interviews because I've, I've bumped into somebody um, walking out of you know, one of the buildings on campus. Um, and you, know, that, you get that one opportunity for that first impression. If you start to think of it as relationship building, you start building in little things into your daily life, it's going to be a lot easier and it's not going to be work. Uh, and things will happen more, more organically. Now, quick little disclaimer, I'm not an expert on networking. I haven't written a book. In fact, the book that I just gave out was written by a friend of mine. Uh, he is a professional networker. So hopefully, you know, read that book, share it, give it to your friends. Um, all I can do is tell you what's worked for me. I can give you some tools that you can put in your toolbox. Some of the things you guys may already be doing. Some of the things may leap you into another idea. But the idea for today uh, is to give you some tools, to give you some techniques, to give you some opportunities to look internally and figure out how you can implement a strategy 
uh, in your own individual life using your skills and using the things that you're good at. The key thing to remember is that we all interact with individuals and people differently. We've got extra extroverts, we've got introverts, we've got individuals that like to make eye contact, we've got individuals that prefer a one-on-one -on -one lunch, we've got individuals that can walk into a room of this size and interact with everybody as if they've known every individual for years. So that being said, there are a lot of different ways to network. And I'm going to give you kind of three examples of networking, relationship building uh, that I used personally. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I benefited from it and what I was able to gain. Uh, the first is student organizations. When I was at the law school, uh, I had the opportunity to help found two organizations, the Business Law Society uh, and the Military Law Student Association. Now, those organizations didn't exist on the Drake Law Campus prior to my involvement. Um, and I, I can't take the credit for it because each one of those organizations, we had about four or five people that helped stand that organization up. <clears throat> but the long and the short is that those organizations gave me a flag that I could fly when reaching out to individuals. I held the vice president's seat for the Business Law Society, and I eventually held the president's seat for the Business Law Society. There's no better introduction than to reach out to an attorney in the Des Moines area, or for that matter, Las Vegas, Washington, and say, hey, I'm the president of the Drake Business Law Society, and I think what you have to say is interesting. Do you have an opportunity or, or a brief moment where we can talk about it? It's a warm introduction. I'm reaching out to Drake alumni. I'm telling them that I, I'm interested in what they have to say, and I've got an introduction. It's not just me reaching out to them, Jeremy Masterson, hey, I think you're cool. It's Jeremy Masterson as part of a you know, recognized student organization. How many people here belong to some type of student organization? There's got to be more hands than that. Come on. It's, I know it's early, but let's, let's bring the hands up a little bit. What do you belong to? Yeah, Peacock Progress. Peacock Progress. What about you in the back? Um, an what is the first one you said? An yeah. Sounds like it's got the opportunity for some fantastic networking. <laughs> and I think that deserves a book. It's always easier if you can find ways to interact with people that, don't, that doesn't require you to do much work. And if you belong to an organization like that, whose sole purpose is to, to connect people with things, then half of the job of networking is already done. All you need to do is execute on it and follow up. Now, uh, a second type or form of networking that I've instituted or been a part of, um, chamber of commerce type events or group, uh, group settings, either put on by cities, put on by student organizations. And I'll tell you one in particular uh, and kind of how I got there. So I've got a good friend, Hal Wilson. Hal Wilson sells suits. Uh, if anybody needs a suit, I'll give you his card. Great guy. Um, but through a conversation with him, through building a relationship with him, he turned me on to this monthly event called Scotch and Cigars. Now, this Scotch and Cigars event, it's kind of a, kind of a campy event. It's a fantastic event. I mean, Scotch and Cigars, thanks. I'll shake hands and drink all day. But what it is, it's, it's kind of through the Waukee Chamber of Commerce, and it's these two financial planners uh, that got together and thought, hey, it'd be a good idea to get people together over Scotch and Cigars. It's not your typical networking event, like I talked about, room full of people throwing one-liners, handing cards. Um, it's a little bit more intimate, and you can probably you know, reason that the people that are going to show up to this event have at least the, the, a similar interest in scotches or cigars. So you've got a baseline conversation down. So Hal Wilson, my relationship with him, connects me to Scotch and Cigars. Scotch and Cigars hooks me up with the financial planning firm, Actus Wealth Management. Now, I did all of this while I was still in law school, so um, what I was looking for, and we'll talk about setting goals next, but what I was looking for, I didn't have any idea. I was just trying to get involved and get my name out there. That was my goal at that time. Well, 
that relationship with those financial planners landed me rental space when I opened my law firm right out of law school. Had it not been for Actus Wealth Management, we probably would have opened our law firm uh, out of our basements, used coffee shops for meetings. But because I was able to build this relationship, because we were able to find common interests, because I was able to connect with these people, uh, they had empty office space and they gave it to us for a song. And it's the only reason that we were able to have a brick and mortar facility uh, on day one when we opened our law firm. And ultimately, uh, it's what propelled us um, to have the success that we've had in the short period of time that we've been open. That Actus Wealth Management relationship turned into invitations to lunch groups, turned into warm handshakes with city council members. I was able to, to springboard the relationships that I had all from one guy, Hal Wilson. Um, and that's the idea. If you take and you start shifting your thought on networking to relationship building, and you find ways to add value on both sides of the equation, networking happens organically. People find ways to connect other people, and you become top of mind uh, in situations where you want to be and where you think you need to go. The, the last one, uh, the last example I'll give you of a type of networking, um, it's similar to kind of a cold call. Now, I call this the new kid on the block email. Um, and that was the subject line that I used for 300 or so emails. New kid on the block in the subject line. And when I opened my firm, I sent it to any person I could think of. I sent it to all the contacts that I had through the student organizations that I had at the law school. Uh, I sent it to pillars of the community individuals who I knew practiced in certain areas of law that were experts in that field. Uh, and it was, you know, a three-line, four-line email. Hey, I'm brand new to the practice of law. I see that you do this. I'd really like an opportunity to pick your brain. Told them who I was, told them why I was contacting them, and told them what I hoped to get out of it. And then I let it ride. Now, of all the emails that I sent out, I think I probably had 20 or 30 that responded. Uh, and you're thinking to yourself, well, those are really crappy odds that sent out 300 and get 20 back. Um, but it's not about the, the quantity of the meetings. It's about the quality of the meetings. I sent out that broad spectrum. I would have met with every single one of them. But the people that did respond to me had a vested interest in that point because now they know why I'm contacting them. They know what I'm looking for. So I don't have to have any expectations going into the meeting other than that. Uh, it took away that anxiety of what are we going to talk about, what do I need to do, how do I need to be prepared, um, and it gave us a baseline that that individual could then come and know that all I wanted to do was hear their story. Um, now, those are those are three ways to network, and I'm sure that you know as you guys sit here today, you guys could implement one or any of those. But the idea is to figure out which one of those styles kind of plays to your strength. Um, can anyone tell me what a SWOT analysis is? Has anybody learned about that yet? S-W-O-T? Well, should I give you a book? <laughs> can, can, can any of the students tell me what a SWOT analysis is? You. Correct. What context is that typically entered into? People do that a lot in business, don't they? It's, it's something that businesses do to try to identify uh, strengths in the market, weaknesses in the market. Um, if they're going to try to get into certain things, you're welcome. Um, you know, where they, need to, uh, where they need to expend funds or where they need to spend their energy. It's totally applicable to the individual setting and to the individual. And I recommend and I challenge you to do a SWOT analysis on yourself. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strength, what are you good at? Personally, I'm really good at work in a room. I can go into a room and talk to anybody about anything, um, and it, it doesn't bother me one bit. My law partner, Charlie, we, him and I can walk into the same room and I'm going to come out with six clients. He's going to come out with a headache. <clears throat> Strengths. It's an environment that I'm better in. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a bad networker. Because when you, when you go to his strengths, he's strong on the one-on-one. -on -one. 
He's strong on building that individual bond. That is where his strength lies. He needs, you know, 30 to 45 minutes or an hour conversation to build that relationship. I can do it in three minutes. But that's what he's good at, and that's what I'm good at. But unless we sit down and identify what our strengths are, we don't know which one of those models of networking is going to be most beneficial to us because we've never identified personally what we're good at. Weaknesses. This is probably, in my opinion, the, the, the most important part of the analysis because it's really easy for us to talk about what we're good at. It's really easy for us to kind of pat ourselves on the back and highlight our awards, highlight our achievements, but nobody wants to look in the mirror and think about what they're not good at. Nobody wants to take that step back and, and, and honestly answer um, where they struggle a little bit. Me personally, I suck at the follow through. I do a great job on the initial introductions, um, but then life happens and you know, kids have soccer and I've got court and before I know it, three months have passed uh, and I, wasn't, I didn't follow up at all. Um, that's one of my weaknesses. Um, but that's also an opportunity because through identifying my strength and my weakness, I can now surround myself with individuals that are going to help complement me on that. Because relationship building and networking isn't just about getting something out of it, it's about building your team, figuring out who you have in your corner, who you have around you that are, that's going to highlight your strengths and make them stronger, and who's gonna help you with your weaknesses. I surround myself with people who remind me of all sorts of things, take the trash out, pick the kids up from school. Hey, send him an email. Didn't you talk to him two weeks ago? That email needs to go out tomorrow. Through my relationship building, I have surrounded myself with individuals that help me on that. So first, identify your strengths. Figure out what you're good at. Identify your weaknesses and be honest about it. You know, I don't like to stand here and tell you that my follow-through sucks, but it's something that I work on. I also want to tell you I suck at remembering names, but it's a weakness. I used to sell soda pop for Coca-Cola and names have always been a problem for me. I love my wife dearly. We've been married 14, almost 15 years. The first full year we dated, I don't know if I could have told you her name. <clears throat> I don't do names. When I was in the military, the greatest thing in the world is that there were name tapes. And eventually you get to a certain rank, you don't have to remember names, it's just ranks. But that's, that's a weakness for me, and that's something that I struggle with, but you've got to identify that. Because until you do that, there's no way that you can get past that or surround yourself with people. My wife and I have a great introductory, introductory thing now. She knows I suck at remembering names, and I think she's forgiven me for not knowing her name for the first year. Um, but now, if we're in group settings and her and I are together, I just introduce her first. Hey, this is my wife, Michelle. And what does that prompt the other person to do? Oh, I'm Jim. Jim, write that down. But she helps me with my weakness, um, and she's a great team member. But that's the idea. Figure out your strengths, figure out your weaknesses, then go to opportunities. Identify the landscape. Do you belong to student organizations that have a worldwide presence? Are you involved in fraternities or sororities that have a national or regional presence? What types of activities do you want to get into after law school, or after law school, eh, don't go to law school, um, after uh, after you know undergrad and what does that landscape look like what types of opportunities are available uh, are there trade groups that you can belong to are there you know quarterly meetings that you can attend as a student for free how many of these things can you belong to and take advantage of now uh, as opposed to having to wait find those opportunities and then because you've already identified your strengths and your weaknesses you will be able to implement and more clearly identify what opportunities are actually going to be in your wheelhouse. The last part of this is threats. And in the business context, threats, you're looking at you know, competitors, uh, you're looking at legislation that could get passed that could affect your business, but on the individual level, you need to take that threat analysis and turn it a little bit. In a way, it's, it's really similar to identifying your weaknesses, um, but the threats could be, you know, I want to go to law school, uh, and I want to have these connections, and I want to have these relationships, but my GPA isn't that great. That's a threat, because that GPA could negatively affect your ability to actually get into law school. Same if you want to go to a grad program. Identify the types of things that are in your life that could be potential threats. Are you associating with people that you maybe shouldn't have? 
you know, in the age of Facebook and Twitter and, and LinkedIn, <clears throat> nobody can be invisible anymore. You can't hide under a rock. Everything is out there. Did you do something when you were 19 that people have photos of that are on Facebook? That's a threat. Because if you come into my office, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at all of that stuff before you sit down. What type of th stuff is out there that could negatively impact your image or put your name out there in a bad way? You want people to, to think positive things when they hear your name. You don't want them to think about the drunken picture of you freshman year. <clears throat> so altogether, that SWOT analysis is what's going to help enable you uh, to figure out the best path and the best course of conduct as it relates to networking and how that's going to be effective for you. Now the key, once you've done that SWOT analysis, is to set a goal. Um, as with anything, networking, relationship building, there should be some type of an end result. If you do it enough and you do it long enough, eventually that goal becomes fluid. You know, when I met the boys at Actus Wealth Management through that Scotch and Cigars, my goal was just to meet people. By the time we had opened up shop, that relationship, the goal of that relationship had shifted because now they were introducing me to people I wouldn't have an opportunity to meet otherwise. So those goals are going to be fluid and flexible based on the situation. But what do you want to do? Do you want to get into a certain profession? Do you, do you want to just meet more people? Do you want to get into grad school? Is that your goal, to build your network? What about finding a job? That's where most people think networking is the most beneficial, finding a job. But if you've got those relationship circles built and you've taken the time to cultivate those relationships, you may have 15 people helping to look for a job. Because as they sit there and talk to their boss and an opportunity becomes available, because you're doing what you learned here, you're following up with these people, you're doing a better job than I am on the follow-up. You've connected with these people, and they now think of you when that job becomes available. But what do you want to get out of it? What's your goal? Uh, and that's going to help drive not only the, the places that you network and the individuals that you try to connect with, but that's going to drive the conversation. What are you hoping to, to, to either gain from this individual, or what can you offer them as value? Uh, it's, going to, it's going to greatly affect how you execute the plan. Now, once you've identified your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, your threats, you set a goal. What do you hope to gain? What does the end result look like? What circle do you want to get involved with? What individual do you want to meet? Now it's time to implement a strategy. Now, personally for me, and, and, I, and I'll tell you, you know, some, some examples that, of, of things that I have done, uh, in the legal profession, I was a pretty small bar. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's people here from Chicago and Minneapolis and Kansas City, um, and it's easy to get lost in cities like that. Iowa, uh, you've got you know, a handful of individuals for any individual area of law, whether it be family law, real estate law. You've got the individuals that are out there writing books about it. You've got the individuals that are out there pushing case law. Those individuals are remarkably hard to get a hold of. If I'm going to just send them an email, the likelihood of me getting a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them is probably pretty low. I might have to go through three or four individual staff members. Uh, I may have to you know, camp outside their office. Now we're worried about stalking and other charges. And those become problems if you want to get into grad school. Uh, so what do I do? Well. I look at that individual that I want to have the handshake with, and I figure out what they like. What are they into? What organizations do they belong to? Does that organization have meetings? Does that organization do networking mixers? Um, do they hold an annual conference? If the answer to any of those is yes, then the next question is, how do I get involved? Um, do I belong to a student organization that could get me a ticket to that conference? Um, is there a way that I can become a member of the trade organization as a student or, or as an active member? And then what does that gain me access to? Who do I know that could propel me, and let's take the Hal Wilson analogy, who do I know that could take me from point A to point B to point C? What, what do the people that I know know? And how can we capitalize on that? That's going to help develop your strategy as to where you focus your time do you send the new kid on the block email? 
or do you start going to the weekly lunch that's you know hosted downtown? Um, identifying where these people are at and how you need to connect with them is going to help develop your strategy. Another key thing in developing your strategy is figuring out what medium to use. Now, you're going to end up with generational gaps in how you communicate and how people communicate with you. There is nothing you can do to stop that. You know, my parents, your parents, the grandparents, they interact with each other differently than you and I would. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it just is a thing. And eventually you guys are going to be standing up here going, God, that music sucks, and oh, my kids used to do this, and when I was a kid I used to walk uphill both ways carrying a warm potato for lunch. Those types of stories, you know, that, that'll be you at some point. And it's not a good thing or a bad thing, but it is something that you need to be aware of, you know. I'm not going to send a Facebook message to a 65-year-old partner of a big firm. That's not going to be the way I initiate communication because they're not going to receive that well. I'm probably going to send them a handwritten note because that's how they communicate. So being able to identify that your communication isn't the only way to communicate with somebody is going to go a long way to broadening who you can contact and in what mediums. Some of these individuals, the new kid on the block email, isn't going to work because they don't check their email anymore. Their staff does. So that staff person's never going to send that email on because they know that there's no value in that for the person that they work for. But I can find a direct phone number for them, and I can call them. That might actually benefit. Um, identifying how these conversations need to happen. I've networked on Facebook. Uh, I've got a LinkedIn profile. Um, I, I make cold calls on a regular basis, I email, I send letters, but I identify who I'm reaching out to and I try to figure out that the best way to, to, to follow up with them. Sometimes it's a phone call right after I send a letter. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. You know, they may, I, in, the, in the conversation, they may tell me that they just got a Facebook account because they want to see their grandkids in Kansas City. So I'm going to send them that handwritten letter, but I might also send them a private message, hey, Hope you're figuring out the Facebook thing. Great conversation. Take care. Right? So, so I've, I've pulled them into a medium that I'm familiar with while still respecting the medium that they acknowledge and use. Um, so be creative on that. Find ways to, to, to get inside people uh, and, and get inside their circles and run. Now, you've done the SWOT analysis. We figured out what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. We've identified some opportunities. You figured out your threats, what you need to try to, to downplay or what you need to try to, to work on. Uh, you've got a goal set. You've developed a strategy. Now it's time for implementation. The implementation is just pulling the trigger. By this point of the process, you've already identified the people that you want to interact with or the groups that you want to belong to. You've already figured out what you're good at and how you're going to be able to connect with these people. Now all you need to do is send the email. Bring your circle in, bring your people in to help with that. If you need somebody to proofread an email, grab your roommate. Hey, can you read this real quick? Just make sure my spelling's right before I hit send on this. Um, hey, I'm getting ready to go out to this, this event. You wanna come with me? It, it'd be a little easier if, if I had somebody with me. Figure out how to implement that next step. Look at your calendar. You know, we, we talked to some students last night, and one of the questions was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to, to build a network in, in a place where I don't belong right now. I'm just not there. Well, the implementation part of this may be identifying your spring break. When can you get back to that area? And then setting everything up so that the Monday of spring break, when you start, you've got four coffees lined up. Tuesday, you've got a breakfast, a lunch, and an afternoon meeting. Implement by planning ahead. Figure out where these people are at and figure out how it's going to fit into your schedule and your time. And then implement it. Get it on the calendar. <laughs> Send the emails. Build a chart. The, one, of, one of the most embarrassing things, and, I, and this is something that, that I learned by um, trial and error, uh, I started doing those new kid on the block emails and probably be a, be a good idea if I kept track who I was sending them to. 
especially for the people that were ignoring me on the responses. Um, but my first batch, I didn't. And I think there were probably four or five individuals that responded, but not in a positive way because it was the fifth one that they received. And it, you know, it was the, if I wanted to talk to you, I would respond to you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now I keep track. I keep a spreadsheet on, on who I reached out to. I keep a spreadsheet on when I reached out to them, the method and the manner, the mode that I reached out to them on. And before I do something else, I check that list. When was the last time this person was contacted? When was the last time I reached out to them? Did they respond? Because you don't want to end up being that broken record. You don't want to end up being that individual who becomes a burden to them. Um, they're going to remember you uh, one way or another. Have them remember you for a positive way. Um, but the implementation, the implementation is critical. The biggest part of the implementation is to do your homework. Oftentimes, uh, and I'm going to use the coffee setting as, as an example. Oftentimes you sit down and, hey, let's grab a cup of coffee. So you sit down with a cup of coffee. You know who this person is. You know who uh, they're associated with. You know what types of things they do because you obviously reached out to them. But do you know anything about them? Have they gotten any awards lately? Are they published? You should probably read whatever they've published. Um, what's their political stance? Is it in line with yours? Is it not in line with yours? Figure out things that, you know, do they have kids? Do they have grandkids? Do your homework on these individuals because what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to sit there across the table from somebody and have that awkward silence because they're expecting you to talk, right? Because just as you've identified your strengths, your weaknesses, you may be really good on the one-on-one -on -one stuff. You may be really, really good on that coffee type, you know, 30 minute session. That may be your strength, but it may not be theirs. So recognize that you may have to pull them out of their shell. And the only way to do that is to know something about them. Read their work. Show interest in the things that they do. Uh, an example, you know, I, I, I do a lot of family law. Uh, when I first started out, I reached out to every uh, person that did family law that I could find opinions on. Uh, these opinions, you know, they're just case law. Iowa Supreme Court writes about them. But now I've got something I can connect with them on. Hey, you worked on this case. Without disclosing, you know, confidential or attorney-client privilege stuff, tell me why you did it this way. What was your strategy? Well, now I've just opened up a, a question. They can't just say yes or no to. They've got to develop it. And they're the ones that worked on it. So I've showed interest in them. I've done my homework so I know the types of stuff that they're involved in. Uh, and I'm able to help push that conversation one way or another if the need arises. We may sit down and they may, they may talk for an hour and a half and I don't even get to ask a question. And that's fine. But I'm ready. I've done my homework. I'm set up if I need to. The homework is the critical and the key part. Now, here's the last part. You've done your SWOT analysis. You've set your goals. You've developed the strategy. You've implemented it. Now what? follow up. Do what I'm not good at. Uh, one of the things, one of the tips that I got from, I think it was a webinar, when I, my first year of law school, uh, an attorney out in Arkansas, what he does is he takes every business card he gets and he logs it. He logs it immediately. So I meet somebody Tuesday night, I get their business card. Wednesday morning I send them an email, great to meet you last night. Um, really hope we can connect or communicate again. And you, you know, really simple. Great to meet you. You're back on their radar. He then does something else. He sets a reminder for a month or two down the road to send them another email. Now that follow-up email, he's going to take some notes on the back of the business card. He's going to make some notes in the contact entry, who they are, what they're into, what was the conversation about, because he then takes that information. And every morning, the very first thing he does before he answers any emails, before he picks up a phone, before he gets his cup of coffee, is he sends out three emails or he sends out three letters to individuals he met a month or two ago using the information that he gathered. Hey, I came across this great article on pipelines and drilling. Thought you might be interested in it. Hope all is well. Talk to you soon. Now, those articles are already there. If you're utilizing things like LinkedIn, you, you can program LinkedIn. You can program your, your information on LinkedIn so that it feeds you stories on a certain, on a certain level. Let them do the work for you. And then when you come in, you get LinkedIn up. You've got the three people you're going to send emails to. You find three stories, 
and you're out. It takes you 15 minutes, but you've done the follow-up. You've kept yourself top of mind with them, and that's the key thing. Now, you, know, you send out 300 emails, 20 people respond. Of those 20 people, I may be able to, re I, I could follow back up with all 20 of them. Maybe 10 of them are going to re-engage me on that follow-up. Again, the numbers are not important. The quantity of the individuals that you reach out to isn't going to help. It's the quality of those relationships. It's becoming a part of that individual's mental process as they think of things. You want them to be in a meeting and think of you for this job opportunity. You want them to be the ones to think of you when it becomes internship time. Who do we want? Who do we have? And you want them to be able to recognize you if you bump into them at a social setting six months down the road. You don't want to be that person, oh yeah, we've, we've already met. Yeah, I know everything about you. Thanks for remembering me. That follow-up helps with that. Um, the key is just don't be discouraged. Be okay with hearing no. And if they don't respond back, understand that they're busy. It's not personal. But that shouldn't deter you from continuing that follow-up. Uh, again, find ways to add value to them. Don't just send them a blank email and say, hey, was thinking of you. Uh, hugs and kisses. You know, love Megan. Bye. You know, <laughs> give them a nugget. Give them something uh, that they can pull away from. And give them something to remember you by. Adding value takes that one-way networking, those one-liners with the cards, and it makes it a two-way street. It shows them that you're interested in more than just what they can offer you. You're, they're, you're showing interest in what they do. Now, those scales are going to be remarkably unbalanced as you first start out, uh, because unless you've already got some of those connections, those, those warm handshakes, um, they're going to be in a different place professionally, personally, uh, and oftentimes they're going to be at, at higher levels uh, in society than you are. Recognize that. That's okay. You're not going to be able to offer the CEO of principal a whole lot. You know, what do you buy the guy for Christmas who has everything? It's that, that kind of mentality. But what you can offer is your time. Are they involved in some sort of a nonprofit? Do they do stuff with Variety Club? Are they connected to the American Heart Association? Can you value you? Can you add value by volunteering to help plan the dinner that they've got going on? You're not going to be able to give them a one-for-one -one thing, but you can still add value to things that they have going on. You know, you're the one asking for the meeting until you're the one being asked for the meeting. And remember that distinction. Eventually, you're going to be the one that people call up for the coffee. But until that happens, find ways to add value to the person that you're asking to meet with. And there's a whole host of ways to do that. The key is just to be creative. The last thing that I, that I kind of want to touch on um, is making this a habit. The more you make this a part of your life, you send those emails every single day, the three emails, you're, you're religious in how you log your contact information, you, you are active in student organizations, and you use those banners to, to pursue uh, enhanced networking or, or enhanced relationship building. The more that you can do that on a daily basis, the easier it becomes, the more organic that it is, and the less work that it is. Um, I'm not saying that you have to wear a suit from now until whenever. Uh, that may not fit in what you want. Uh, for me, it worked. You know, this, I, I spent eight years in the military. I wore a lot of camouflage. I consider this my new camouflage. It's urban camo. It's my uniform. Um, I've always got a pen, always got business cards. It's just part of what I wear now. Uh, I don't have to think about going to an event, oh, do I have business cards, do I have this? Because it, they're already in my suit. Um, I don't have to think about, okay, what, who should I reach out to tomorrow? Because tomorrow I'm going to reach back out to the people I talked to two months ago. It's habit. It's part of my daily routine. Uh, I interact with people the same way in uh, the line at hy V as I do in... Uh, a bar event, you know, a, a formal dinner. Um, I have the same types of talking points. I'm constantly looking at ways to add value to other people. Who can I connect this person to? Because now, when I reach back out to them, I, I can say, hey, I just talked to this person. Uh, it would be really great if you two would meet. I send the email marrying them. I've now added value to two people. And that's just something that changes the way you think. If you change the way you think a little bit, you shift it from networking to relationship building, and you make it part of your daily life. 
you make it habit, everything else starts to come together. You'll be amazed on the opportunities that present themselves, the doors that are going to open, because all of that stuff just starts to happen. Um, and that's the, that's the stick. Questions, comments, concerns, divine revelations? First two questions, get a book. I got two left. And these are, this is a good book. Going, going back to the, I'm not an expert at networking, this guy is an ne expert at networking. One of the first individuals I met when I was, started my law firm, uh, a guy named Danny Beyer, um, he, he wrote this book on networking. Um, I've pulled a lot of stuff out of it, and I think it does a really good job of distilling down and breaking down um, some of the things that we've talked about today and giving you some, some strategies. This is a much more in-depth deal than what I've got. Was it the book that sold you on the, on the asking the question? Yeah. Totally the book. I'll make sure to tell Danny. Um, you know, I, I was a conscientious objector to Facebook for a really long time. I fought it. I didn't want to belong to it. I didn't want to participate in it. Um, I don't care about your cat. You know, that, that, was, that was Facebook to me. I'm sorry. I'm sure your cat's wonderful. I really am. I'm just no more pictures, please. <laughs> We're not Facebook friends, I don't, so I don't have any idea about her cat. <laughs> um, the online stuff uh, can be difficult because it goes back to who are you trying to reach out to and in what mediums. Um, if you're trying to reach out to the partners in firms or the individuals, um, upper management and above, Facebook, LinkedIn, those types of things may not be an appropriate setting. The, the real takeaway, and I'll tell you that the two heavy hitters are LinkedIn and Facebook. Those are the two that I operate within. Um, I do more probably with Facebook than I do LinkedIn. That profile I, I, I tend to forget about quite a bit. The key if you're going to use any of those mediums is to determine how you want it to use it. Don't mix a business Facebook account with your personal account. If you're going to have a Facebook account, have a Facebook account. If you're going to use that to try to network and relationship build, recognize what you put online. Take more time to decide what type of content you want out there. Do you want the employer to pull up your Facebook page uh, and see uh, every picture you're holding a beer. It may not be crazy. You, you know, you may not be covered in mud. You not, may not be throwing your arms up with glow sticks. Um, but do you want every picture on your Facebook page to be you holding a beer? Um, what do you want that Facebook page to say about you? That's the key thing. If you're going to use electronic medium, if you're going to use those social media outlets, be really, really aware of what you're putting out there, um, because the content that you put out there is going to drive everything else. Um, and, you know, I mean, we've all heard this, nothing ever goes away. Once you post it, it's out there forever. You can delete it, I can find it. Um, and that's the key thing on that, using it. LinkedIn is the same way. Um, build your profile. Where, where people mess up on LinkedIn is they're always on Facebook. It's easy to update your profile. You're always changing your picture. Uh, the status updates always change. That's, that's a very free-flowing form of information. LinkedIn tends to be a little more static. You go into LinkedIn, what I'm guessing you'll find is a lot of individuals that set up a LinkedIn account, having great ideas, leaving an event like this going, I'm going to LinkedIn, baby, it's going to be awesome. And then they never touch their profile. And six months from now, they're in different student organizations. Their career has changed. They've got different relationships. And their LinkedIn profile isn't reflective at all of who they are. So on the LinkedIn side, stay on top of updating it. Make sure all of your contact information is on there. Uh, and the great thing about LinkedIn that Facebook doesn't necessarily offer is the ability to uh, condense the content that comes to you directly. Spend the time on LinkedIn to have it build a memory. Have them send you news articles. Have them send you content. Take the time to develop those strategies. It's no different than, you know, if you guys are Pandora users, the thumbs up, thumbs down. If you use that after about six weeks, you're going to have a pretty solid music station of songs that you enjoy. LinkedIn is kind of the same way, but it's about making it a habit. Wake up in the morning, jump on Facebook, see who's saying what, jump on LinkedIn, get your articles, send your articles to the people that you're reaching out to, 
and then move on with your day. That answer your question? Great. Yes? Uh, you are one of our advisors on the Upper Iowa University Career Advisor. You get a book too. <laughs> yes? Sure. Sure. Um, the biggest benefit that you guys have is that at the end of this road, you're going to be UIU graduates. Now, the value of my degree is directly connected to how well each of you do. I need people to know who you are because if they don't know you, they don't know me and they don't know my degree. It makes sense for me to go to Upper Iowa, and I love being a peacock, and I love getting to tell people that, hey, I graduated summa cum laude from Upper Iowa University. I love this institution. But that only goes so far. You then have to take the baton and take it to the next step. I belong to that, um, and I can't remember what it is because nobody ever talks to me on it. Nobody ever sends me any messages on it. I think I've gotten two, maybe three people that have reached out to me. But if I can do something to help you succeed, if I can present a, a, a medium or a format that allows you to just log in to something through your UIU portal and reach out to me, if I can make it easy for you to connect with me, then it becomes easier for me to help you connect with others. Just because uh, I'm an Upper Iowa graduate, I'm going to try to help other Upper Iowa graduates. You reach out to me, I'm going to use whatever network I've got to propel your career. Because none of us succeed unless we all succeed. We're all in this boat together. And it doesn't do anybody any good for a university to, to die out after three generations. You have to have the individuals reaching back out to the individuals who are going to reach back out to the individuals. Because that's what adds value to the degree. I'm sure everybody came to Upper Iowa for one reason or another. Maybe sports, uh, maybe academics. Uh, you, may, you may just enjoy the atmosphere, the class size, where the school is located. But regardless of why you came to Upper Iowa, you're going to graduate with an Upper Iowa degree. And that alone gives you connections to the entire Upper Iowa alumni base. And the great thing about Upper Iowa is that it is more than just the Fayette campus. I'm here in front of you because I graduated from Fayette, but I, I attended all of my classes in West Des Moines. I still resonate and relate to everything that happens on campus. I love getting the emails about football games. I love hearing about homecoming because that's part of my degree. That's part of my history. That's part of my pedigree. But it's only as good as the individuals that are going to carry to that next step. So if you've got things um, at your disposal through Upper Iowa portals or, or the Career Development Office puts something out there that you have an opportunity to participate in, those are the easiest things to get involved with because somebody else does the work. <laughs> that, that's great. All you need to do is show up. You know, I'm sure, and I think we were talking earlier about, what was your name again? Emily. Emily. You plan an event for, what, 500-some people? Wouldn't you rather just attended it? Yeah, yeah. Take that opportunity now. You've got people whose sole job it is to help you connect to other people, to create that warm handshake. Uh, and that's why I belong to that. That's why I enjoy giving back. That's why I like coming back here, because I like to share the story of, of what I've been able to accomplish. And ultimately, it all stems from Upper Iowa. I wouldn't be an attorney today if it wasn't for Upper Iowa. I had two professors, um, uh, Mr. Heinscheid uh, and uh, Chris Cragness. They were adjunct professors at the Des Moines campus. Um, the super awesome thing is that they were attorneys and they answered my questions. What's it like to be an attorney? What's the LSAT like? What is my Monday through Friday going to look like? Uh, and both of them tried to discourage me from going to law school. You know, talk to me in 10 years, I'll tell you if I made a, uh, made a bad choice. It's working for now. But I had that relationship uh, and that's what propelled me into the next thing. That's what enabled me to prep for the next thing. Uh, and it's all because Upper Iowa provided those opportunities. Any more questions? How are we doing on time? I know it's early, but you guys have to have something. I drove all the way, three hour drive, nothing? You've already asked a question, but I'll let you ask another one. Or you answered a question, didn't you? I don't have another book, I'm sorry. Okay, shoot.
Um, well, let me, I'll give you an example similar to kind of what I've got. Well, it goes back to always be turned on, and you, you have no idea what doors could open if you don't network outside of your circle. I don't do any estate planning. I don't draft wills. I don't deal with probate. Um, I don't like the work. I'm not very good at it, so I don't do that. But that doesn't mean that I don't network with attorneys that do because that attorney may have a family law case and they don't like to do family law, so it's going to come my way. I'm going to be more top of mind because I don't compete with them in their field. It's going to be easier for them to think of me because when they sit down and go, you know, who's not in my circle that I could throw this to, or I'm going to stick out more. Um, it's really critical, and I think, I think people do themselves a disservice when they focus all of their attention on what their interest is. You end up surrounding yourself with a bunch of yes people. You don't get that cross-section of society. You don't get a lot of people pulling in different directions, and you're not very diverse. By, by making sure that you go outside of your comfort zone, by making sure that you interact with people outside of either your chosen field or your profession, not only is it going to help you stay grounded, but it's going to give you a, a wider range of people that are working for you. And that is, that's something that's, that's, that's wholly valuable. Um, start out connecting with people that are in your profession because that's where you're going to derive the most immediate benefit. But don't overlook the opportunities that exist um, for either competing or complementary areas, either of practice or professions, because you never know where you're going to end up landing at the end of this. I can go through law school and I can interact with litigators all day long because I want to be a litigator, but I'm going to miss out on corporate jobs. Principal, they hire litigators. If all I do is interact with individuals from firms that litigate, I'm going to miss uh, entire companies that could potentially have work for me. Um, so getting out of your comfort zone is a really important thing and making sure that you have a wide and diverse, uh, I guess, cross-section of people that you're interacting with is pretty important. Anything else? Ma'am. And, and that's a great question, because I, th I think that highlights um, what I think is a, is a common misconception on what networking is. Um, because, you know, networking in that context, you know, okay, so I can widen, my, I can widen my, my, my spectrum of people that I deal with, but, you know, I'm not going to really benefit that much from networking, because my job doesn't require me to network. But... It's less about what your job requires and more about what you require. If you think of it in the, in the, in the context of relationship building, those skill sets and that, that method of acting and all the stuff that I've just talked about today is still completely applicable because it's going to put you in contact with new teaching methods. It's going to put you in contact with individuals who might be able to provide a resource um, for a new bill that gets passed, the legislation that's going to come through that's going to affect how you operate in the classroom. Um, nursing profession, same type of deal. It's going to put you in contact with individuals that can benefit you professionally and keep you on top of your game. It may provide opportunities down the road for different types of careers. Um, you have no idea where those relationships can go. You know, you may be happy, you know, I'm going to be a fifth grade teacher, so I don't need to go to networking events. I don't need to hand out business cards. I'm going to teach fifth grade biology. It's, you know, it's just what I'm going to do. Um, but I think you do yourself a disservice with that because you still need to grow as an individual. There's still tons of content that's out there that's going to change. There's still abilities that you have to interact with parents. You may be able to, to through some form of networking, um, get a structure or a format on how to better, better handle conferences with parents. Um, you may end up with a problem student that you just don't know how to handle. Well, if you've, if you've done the relationship networking that we've discussed today, you may have somebody that you can reach out to who's not in your school, who may not even be in your state, but 
who is connected in some way, shape, or form to your profession. They may do nothing but psychology work, but you happen to attend a seminar that they spoke at de talking about unruly kids. And because you got their business card, because you sent them the follow-up letter, because three months after that initial meeting you reached out to them, you have the ability now to call them for a favor because you've got, you, know, you don't have to talk to them daily to keep that relationship intact, but they're going to know who you are when you called. And that goes back to the initial, the initial deal. What's your goal? What do you want to gain out of this? What do you need? What's going to, to benefit? And that's going to drive the types of things that you, that you run into. Um, if you're a nurse, if you're a student, you may not do a lot of the one-on-one -on -one coffees. Bless you. In those, in those situations, you may do more trade organizations. You may do more group seminars. Um, but it's about, again, identifying where you're going to get the biggest bang for your bunk and then implementing it. But that's a great question. Anything else? Sir? Shoot. Uh, I like the movie The Notebook, uh, Quiet Nights by the Fire, Long Walks in the Park. I'll tell you, um, I, you know, I get that question a lot, and uh, I never know how to answer it because I work. That's what I do. Um, I came back from overseas in 2004, um, got hooked up with Upper Iowa pretty soon thereafter. Um, when I went to Upper Iowa, I was working 60 to 70 hours a week. I had class three, four nights a week. I still had a military commitment. Um, so I work, you know, my, what I do for fun, um, I work and that's, that's pretty much it. Since, since 2004, I've been able to gradually take things off of my plate. Um, but I started a law firm right out of law school. You know, we were, we were sworn in on a Friday, my partner, Charlie and I, we signed the incorporating documents that day. And I signed my first client the following Monday. Um, I hope to have time for fun at some point. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, I, I work and I hang out with my family. I don't, I don't get to lift weights. Uh, I'd like to bike, but I mean, you see me limping up here. The last thing I need is to break another bone, but good try. <laughs> if my wife is watching, she's like, yeah, you need to work less and hang out more. But that's, it is what it is. Anything else? Awesome. Um, well, on your chairs are um, some kind of comment cards. Uh, I would really appreciate if you guys gave honest feedback. If you got some criticism, I got really, really thick skin. I did eight years in a recon unit, so there's nothing you can say that hurts my feelings. But it helps to ensure that if I do one of these again, um, I'm able to, to strengthen things that worked uh, and change things that didn't. It also helps give the administration an idea of what types of activities and what types of conversations are going to be helpful and beneficial to you. Because at the end of the day, the administration of Upper Highway University is here to ensure you guys succeed. So you need to be able to give them the feedback so they can give you the tools and the opportunities to make that happen. Uh, so make sure you take some time to, to, to run that. I'll stick around for a little bit if anybody has questions. Um, and please, at any point in your life, reach out to me. I'd be happy to meet with you individually. I'd be happy to share a little bit more about things that have worked and not worked. Uh, and I'd love to help uh, be a part of your success. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come here. Um, and go Peacocks. <laughs>